I started at Amazon in 2006 as a support engineer, a person responsible for keeping the website up and running. It's an important job, but sometimes when everything was broken, it felt like I was a digital janitor, constantly cleaning up other people's messes. I had to carry a pager. It was not uncommon to be paged more than 100 times in a week. Whenever I was paged, I had to stop whatever I was doing and log on to see what the issue was. There was no end to it. It happened day and night. Usually, carrying the pager is spread across all of the members of your team. However, when I arrived at Amazon, several people were leaving. As a result, for many months, I was the only one carrying the pager. This difficult period in my life turned out to be a turning point as it motivated me to take action. As Tony Robbins said, change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. I knew that I didn't want to be a support engineer for the rest of my life, even if my on-call shifts got better. I wanted to be a software developer, write code, and build systems. So I went all in on preparing for the technical interview to become a software developer while I had a heavy on-call load. Now, I'm an L7 principal software engineer. I've also conducted 850 technical interviews. I'm a bar raiser, and I've trained over a thousand people at Amazon how to conduct interviews. And I finally know why I was successful back then. In this video, I'll share with you three big lessons I learned while I was digging myself out of that hole so you don't have to go through the heartache I did. This is my free gift from Uncle Steve to you. All I ask is that if you find my content useful, you subscribe to my channel and email newsletter where I help tech professionals level up in their careers. There's a link in the description. The first lesson is a mental block that people have when they're interviewing and it holds them back and makes them feel bad about themselves unnecessarily. Preparing for interviews is emotionally and physically draining, so you want to minimize the time it takes to get an acceptable offer. If you don't learn this lesson, you'll drag things out longer than you have to. I see it all the time in people that I talk with, and I don't understand how it got into their heads. It can ruin their chances of getting a different job, and it also kills their self-esteem. And that lesson is that interviewing is a numbers game. When I was younger, I wanted to become a professional poker player. And if ever there was a numbers game, it's professional poker. And the sick part about it is that you can have the best hand, two aces, and still lose that hand. And you can have the worst hand, a 2-7 offsuit, and still win. You make money in poker over time by making good decisions hand after hand. And so, with interviewing, you should not expect to win every time, even if you have prepared everything perfectly. When I was finally ready to do software developer interviews, I didn't do just one interview. I lined up four interviews. Looking back at it, I probably should have lined up 10. I ended up receiving three offers from those four, which allowed me to be selective. If I had spent all that time targeting just one team, it could have been the team that passed on me. I would have felt terrible, and it might have discouraged me. At the very least, it would have prolonged the time it took to actually receive an offer. If you know anything about recruiting, it's that they operate on their own schedule. At some companies, they're fast and efficient. At some companies, they aren't so fast and efficient. You want to start the process with many companies in parallel, not serially. When you're interviewing, don't become emotionally invested in a single opportunity. There are too many external factors that you can't control. You could encounter an inexperienced interviewer who had a bad day or stepped in dog poop right before your interview. They might ask you the one question you wanted to prepare for but couldn't get to. Perhaps they already interviewed a superstar earlier that week and the position is already filled. When interviewing, segment the companies you're interested in into a tier list. With proper preparation, you should expect at least one offer from your top tier. Use the companies in the lower tier as practice to reduce nervousness in subsequent interviews. Plus, who knows, maybe a lower tier company will surprise you. By practicing with these companies, good things are more likely to happen. The second lesson I learned is a common complaint that I've heard from many people, and it holds them back because they think the world shouldn't be this way. They prepare the way they think that things should be instead of the way that things actually are. It's a common trap that I've also fallen into. During a question, I went off on a tangent and it led me to not receiving an offer. That lesson is that interviews are not intended to test your day-to-day -day job skills. Instead, the purpose is to ensure that companies never hire a bad candidate, even if that means filtering out people who would otherwise perform well in that job. The gatehouse does not resemble the clubhouse. The skills that make you successful at work are not the same as those that make you successful at interviewing. There are two types of poker, limit and no limit. In limit games, the number of chips you can put into the pot is capped, while in no limit games, the amount you can bet is not capped. Even though the rules are otherwise exactly the same, these games could not be more different. During a system design interview, I was once asked to design a system that I had actually built in real life. I was thrilled to receive that question and I could hardly contain my excitement. I had filed patents in this area and I was intimately familiar with how to actually build these systems in real life. I could talk about it forever. 
But where I took the question was not the same place as the interviewer wanted to go. And so I bombed that question that I should have crushed because I thought the interviewer wanted to talk about what it actually took to build one of these systems in production when actually he wanted to talk about something else. I've seen it on both sides of the table. When I ask a system design question, I'm not actually asking you to design a system. That takes weeks or months. I'm trying to have an interesting conversation about some of the topics I want to talk about to size you up. Companies don't give you real world work during interviews because it takes longer than the hour they have to evaluate you. Instead, they ask proxy questions to minimize false positives. It can be frustrating to be filtered out because the interviewer wanted to talk about some arbitrary thing, even though you may be a good fit for the job. However, it's best not to take it personally and recognize that it's a numbers game. Companies are optimizing for minimal false positives. So when you go into an interview, you need to make sure to listen to what the interviewer is saying and let them guide you through their questioning. If you play a no limit game, like a limit game, you're gonna get destroyed. Don't get caught playing the wrong game because you think the world should be a different way. Before we continue, I'd like to drop a quick note for today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Just like the best way to prepare for a coding interview is by doing coding problems, if you're trying to learn math, science, or computer science, the best way to do so interactively is with Brilliant. Reading or passively watching YouTube videos is probably the worst way to learn something. Not only does the information not stick, it gives you a false sense that you understand things deeply when you don't. With Brilliant's interactive courses, you can learn the key concepts and practice your skills in the same place. Brilliant has lessons on everything, with new ones added every month. From probability to machine learning, there's so much content on Brilliant. I really value continuing education. If I didn't have to work, I just take courses all day. I'm currently working through the Kurtzgazat Beyond the Nutshell content on space, disasters, and life. It's mind-blowing, entertaining, and educational in a way that just watching their videos isn't. To try everything Brilliant has to offer, free, for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash alifeengineered or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. The third lesson is the most important of all. It's a trap that one can fall into even if they've been crushing their interview prep. I've noticed this phenomenon frequently in the past couple of years with the rise of leak code and the tech interview prep industry. It's a form of target fixation that can lead to downleveling, or worse, not getting an offer even if you've answered all of the questions perfectly. And that lesson is only focusing on the technical portion of the interview. In poker, if you only look at your hand and don't take anything else into consideration, you're only seeing part of the picture. To be successful, it's important to consider your position, the number of chips you have, as well as the number of chips the other players have, and how they're behaving. Yes, you should get good at lead code and system design questions, but the technical portion of the interview is the ante. It's a necessary but not sufficient condition to get the offer. The behavioral portion of a job interview is critical to actually landing the job. This is where interviewers ask about your prior experience. You want to make sure you tell good stories, that communicate your high performance, seniority, and relevant experience, and avoid raising red flags, such as giving them the impression that you're difficult to work with. It can also be the difference when you have a lukewarm performance during the technical portion of the interview. If you have three technical interviews, one bombed, one's really good, and one was just okay, the conversation is gonna to shift to the behavioral portion of the interview. If you have a good showing there, you may be able to salvage an offer. When I was interviewing for SDE positions, I didn't crush the technical portions. I did okay. I did make sure though that the answers to the soft questions demonstrated that I was a fast learner, thorough with my work, a good coworker, and hungry for more. And I think that was the critical difference to getting all of those offers. Of course, none of this matters if you don't do decently well in the technical portion of the interview, but it doesn't take too much effort to make sure you have good answers to behavioral questions. So don't neglect them because they aren't technical. If you want to know how to answer these questions effectively and avoid getting down leveled, I break it down step by step in this video. If you got the job and want to know what to do next, take a look at this video where I break down what new software developers should focus on. Either way, work hard and don't let your Uncle Steve down.